The year 1940 was a pretty wild one for one 19-year-old Czech woman named Eva Saxel. She and her husband fled Czechoslovakia when the Nazis took over and settled in China as far away from war as they could possibly get, right? <laughs> anyway, months later, she passed out on the floor and was diagnosed with diabetes. Not a grim diagnosis at all, right? Especially in 1940. Well, she was able to get insulin at first, but after Pearl Harbor, the Japanese began to really up their occupation in China. All the pharmacies in Shanghai shuttered their doors, and that left Eva with no way to get insulin for this life-altering condition. And this could be you someday. So later in the video, I'll tell you what Eva and her husband did and how they also saved the lives of an additional 400 Shanghai residents as well. Now, today there are at least 40 million people living with type 1 diabetes, and they rely on a steady, stable supply of insulin. Not only do they need a steady, stable supply of it, but it needs to be kept cold or it'll expire, it'll go bad. So diabetics also need a steady, stable supply of power in order to refrigerate their meds. Problem being, it's 2025 and not much about the world is steady or stable anymore. And it seems like all it's gonna take is one little nudge and it'll all go spiraling into World War III or some other totalitarianism or civil unrest, pick your poison. Us diabetics, have two choices before us when considering those eventualities. Option number one, be the first to die when the electricity shuts off and all the pharmacies close. Or two, work twice as hard now in your preparations beforehand. And I'm advocating for the latter choice in this video. Uh, as a quick disclaimer, I am not a doctor or a medical expert, but I do have type 1 diabetes, so take everything I say here from personal experience with a grain of salt and obviously for reference only. What is the problem? Type 1 diabetics have a dysfunctional pancreas, and that's the organ responsible for producing the hormone insulin. Insulin's role in the body is to allow muscles and organs to utilize sugars from the food that you eat, and convert it into energy. So yeah, no insulin, no energy. Obviously a bad thing. And without it, you'd almost certainly die within a month to maybe a year if you stretch out the inevitable, the rotation. So what are we going to do about this? Try to get at least three months to a year's worth of insulin stored up. But how do you do this when typically prescriptions are only filled for about three months? Well, you do this by building up a rotational inventory. And that's where you will refill when you have one bottle left on that three month prescription until you have about 12 bottles stored up. And at this point, you will revert back to the old prepper inventory management scheme of first in, first out. Insulin should last at least two to three years when properly stored. So having a year buffer for hopefully society to stabilize and you can get back to regular life is good enough. Now don't commit medical fraud. Don't tell them you're using twice as much insulin as you actually are. But I think most doctors would buy off an at least like 10 to 20% margin. So using this method, you should be able to get a three month buffer no problem after about a year and a year buffer after three, four years of doing this. Storage methods. Insulin needs to be stored at around 39 degrees Fahrenheit, plus or minus maybe five degrees. Don't freeze it because that actually denatures the insulin, forming ice crystals that break apart the protein structure. This will result in significant loss of potency. At 36 to 46 degrees, it will last until the expiration date, typically two to three years. And at room temperature, it may still last up to six months unopened. And anything to keep it cool will help, such as placing it in a root cellar, maybe even a cave. But at elevated temperatures, up to 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, the potency goes way down after a month or two. 
and anything above body temperature results in rapid degradation from days to weeks. So all this is good news and bad news. I mean, if you lose power for a few days, it hasn't instantly destroyed all your insulin. So there's no need to panic when you're trying to figure out backup power methods in that moment. But for long-term grid outages, such as in localized disasters, like in North Carolina after Hurricane Helene last year, or maybe the big boogaloo of preppers, the EMP attack that takes down the whole infrastructure, then you're going to have to come up with a sustainable off-grid solution. My solution involves a 12-volt fridge with a small solar-powered battery backup. I recommend a 12-volt fridge because it's easier to get 12-volt sources of power um, than, you know, 120-volt AC. So I have this simple 60-watt solar panel that powers a 12-volt battery in this man pack that I use for my radio stuff. And uh, barring that, I, I think this is this is more than enough to keep it charged. But if not, I do have a small gasoline generator. And that is by no means portable because it also comes with about 15 five-gallon canisters of gasoline that I rotate out every month. That was heavy! And don't forget to add the stable additive that keeps it fresh for up to two years. If at all possible, have two solutions for backup storage because Murphy's Law loves it when you only have one solution for something critical like this. Remember, two is one, one is none. Additionally, I could also power the main fridge with the big generator, but this is not a good long-term solution since it would use up more gasoline. Aside from the insulin itself, you will want to think about buffers and backups for testing, insulin delivery, and sugar raising methods. For testing, I normally use a CGM from Dexcom, and I don't have a buffer inventory on these yet. I should probably get on that. But once I do, if supply lines were disrupted, I would likely switch to finger stick testing unless I was going to be conducting any dangerous ops or patrols or activities like that, or I would want to have real-time info on what my blood sugar is doing. Finger stick testing is simple enough to build a buffer. You don't have to worry about the whole prescription margin dance because of the plethora of relatively affordable over-the-counter options. Most diabetics are on a pump these days, which you should be because it's hands down the best way of controlling your blood sugar. So you will want to have an inventory of infusion sets, but this is kind of annoying because they're usually pretty expensive. So for redundant delivery options, I hope you're able to find a source of syringes. They got a lot harder to source a few years ago due to the drug epidemic and doctors being hesitant to prescribe them, but I still have a box from a long time ago. Sugar raising methods. Not much to say here, just have an inventory of glucose and you may want to put a glucagon kit in your individual first aid kit that you carry with you in all your bug out gear, which everyone has an IFAC, right? All told, diabetics are resilient. In the civil defense world, they can make great teammates. In the military, though, Uncle Sam doesn't have time for your extra needs, which is why diabetics get the 4F disqualification on the draft. Yay? But you've taken care of yourself, and you're all the stronger for it. If you follow the simple steps in this video, that's one less headache when the poop hits the fan, leaving ample brain power and energy to tackle other pressing problems like calm, security, and food security, as well as medical assistance. And who knows, the preparations you've made may be a service to many more people as a result. So back to Eva Saxel, a young Czech woman living in China, which is being occupied by Imperial Japan, and no way to get insulin, which was still a relatively new thing. It was developed back in the early 20s by Frederick Banting and team. Uh, and with the way they did it back then was they would actually take animal pancreases, usually from pigs and cows and other slaughtered animals, uh, and then extract the insulin from that pancreas into an into a alcohol solution and then um, inject that into the patients. Maybe a little more to it than that, but that's roughly what, what, what they were doing. Um, and so Eva, she contacted a 
chemist in China and said, hey, can I use your lab? And we're going to try making insulin ourselves. And the way they would do this, um, test it usually, they would take pancreases from either rabbits or dogs and make the solution. So then they would induce diabetes in these animals by removing the pancreas and then inject the solution back in to see if it worked. Um, So it's kind of odd, but you know, better than testing on humans. The risky part about all of this is that the the pancreatic solution, the insulin solution that they would come up with was not very safe. It could it could cause allergic reactions or bacterial infections in the patients quite easily. And so um, sometimes it was maybe not even worth the the benefit that you might be getting because it was just so risky. Um, but by this point, they had figured out the process pretty well. So Eva and her husband were able to duplicate it there in China with limited resources. So they used water buffalo and then they tried it out on a few of their friends from the Jewish ghetto in Shanghai and it worked. And so then they also helped like two or 200 or 400 additional people um, save their lives. Basically, gave them one injection per day. They would they would you know have a insulin drive. Basically, I come get your daily shot of insulin, and uh, I think they saved a lot of lives. But I I'm mentioning this as something to think about in case of extreme measures. I don't think you should ever try this, except if the world ever were completely like Mad Max, uh, end of the world type of thing. And society had completely broken down. There is, there's no such thing as a pharmacy. There's no such thing as uh, a lab, um, (laughs) or, uh, oh, I wanted to mention, uh, how they make insulin nowadays is they, they take bacteria kind of like yeast um i think they use yeast maybe something else and then they in- inject the um human insulin gene into it some kind of magic sciencey thing that i'm not going to pretend to understand and then um that that tricks the bacteria into producing the insulin um and then it's much much safer than chopped up pancreatic brown mush so uh, that's how they make it nowadays. But that's a very involved process that only three companies in the world are able to do or are allowed to do. There's a whole politics thing involved in that. If you search on YouTube, most of the videos about this topic are from a, a certain uh, ideological perspective that is kind of... Um, but I am definitely sympathetic to providing regulations that allow more companies to produce the product uh, after so much time has elapsed. I don't think that they should be able to ever green it forever, but it's a whole rabbit hole. I think in the, so there's, there's, there's been a project in San Diego. I think it's San Diego called the open insulin project. And um, this is kind of an example of they're doing great stuff. They're, they're doing, they're trying to develop a way of, making safe insulin cheaply um, and so that communities can make their own insulin um, without being stuck paying $230 a bottle to these three companies that are able to make the insulin. Um, But they are kind of like anti-capitalist kind of thing, uh, which I would say, I mean... There's there's an element of society that just wants to be Luigi Mangione and and dome some healthcare CEO, uh, and 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 that's not good. Uh, I I think okay I, all car all cards on the table. I'm a, I would say I'm a conservative, um, who typically are more suspicious of big government than big business. However, big anything has the potential to create tyranny in our lives, and especially when big government and big business join hands, and that creates the worst soup of tyranny of them all. Anyway, soapbox over. Basically, if if it involves the labor of others, it's not a human right. So that's the story of Eva and Victor Saxel, and I hope you found that inspiring. 
As for my channel, if you found this video because you're a diabetic, um, feel free to like and not subscribe unless you're also interested in prepping, firearms, citizen preparedness, radio stuff, all that kind of thing. Um, because if, if you're not going to watch any more of my videos, it won't help me if you subscribe because the algorithm doesn't like it when you kind of uh, have subscribers that aren't, re aren't coming back. So, but feel free to like this video and I'm so glad if it was helpful to you and gets you to start thinking about ways you can be prepared for any potential collapse, whether it's a small isolated thing, whether it's COVID or whether it's, you know, a natural disaster like Helene or whether it's Mad Max end of the world. So prepare now, get a rolling buffer of insulin and other supplies, have backup power solutions, and just be ready for anything. I spent a lot of time on this one. As you can see, I'm wearing other clothing than the beginning of the video, but it's a topic that I wanted to get right because I know it's something I care a lot about and there's a lot of people that don't even bother because why bother, they think? Why why try to prepare for disasters when it's not even going to make a difference? Um, if something like that were to ever happen to me, uh, I'd rather just die. <laughs> I've actually heard people talk like that. But that's ridiculous because if you can, if you can prepare for a disaster, you can have a peace of mind and you'll also be more, more stronger and more resilient in everyday things as well. So think about that. I always forget how to end the videos. I need a tagline. It, guys, help me come up with a tagline. All right, bye. I hope that this microphone isn't picking up the cat meowing.